Self-driving cars aren't just here, they're everywhere. They're still in testing, sure, but this technology is on its way. It's just a matter of when and where it'll land first. And when that happens, robot cars will likely change society as we know it, just as the personal automobile did a century ago. People have dreamed of owning a self-driving car for generations, but until recently, it seemed impossible. So I always thought autonomous vehicles would happen. To be honest, I didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. The idea of a driverless car became a lot more real about a decade ago. That's when a group of engineers and roboticists gathered for an unprecedented competition called the DARPA Urban Challenge. This is absolutely astounding. Each team brought comes. something unique to the table, from breakthroughs in artificial intelligence to advanced laser sensors to, well, let's just call it public relations. Axion has twin NAVCOM units. It was the moonshot of the robotics world. Without the challenge idea, there would just not be a self-driving car today. The task looked incredibly hard. You had to build a car that would drive itself without a person inside. I think the grand challenge proved to the world that it was possible. Victor Tango, Odin, is just about to cross the finish line. When we think of autonomous cars today, it's Tesla, Google, and Uber that come to mind. But the industry wasn't born in Silicon Valley or even Detroit. It came from here, of all places. In the early 2000s, Congress decided to invest in driverless vehicles. Not so that we could commute to work while checking Facebook, but to keep soldiers safer on the battlefield. And they tapped the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, aka DARPA, to make it happen. That's the same agency that helped create the Predator drone and Agent Orange, along with GPS and the internet. So in 2004, the US government held a new kind of competition to jumpstart the industry, the DARPA Grand Challenge. It was the first of three races that would help make self-driving cars a reality. Before the DARPA Grand Challenge, the US government had spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to build self-driving cars. And lo and behold, uh, most of this money didn't yield the expected results. Instead of funding its usual stable of defense contractors, DARPA decided to open the problem up to anyone interested in cracking it. It would hold a race across the Mojave Desert for 100% driverless cars, with a million dollar prize for whoever finished fastest. The response was enormous. Teams applied from all over the country, representing universities, high schools, and groups of friends with a taste for engineering. DARPA didn't have any preconditions for participation, right? Like anybody could show up and you saw everybody show up. It felt like it was anybody's game. But from the beginning, the Grand Challenge had a front runner. Carnegie Mellon University, home to the nation's oldest and most prestigious robotics institute, and also to William Red Whittaker, a former Marine who'd sent robots into hazardous environments like nuclear reactors and volcanoes. It isn't enough just to uh, do the technology and uh, hide it in a laboratory. It really mattered to uh, take it to the world. On the day of the challenge, in March 2004, the 15 finalist teams gathered in the desert northeast of Los Angeles. They would start five minutes apart, each following a GPS route that would take them 142 miles from Barstow, California to Prim, Nevada. Ladies and gentlemen, Sandstorm. First out of the gate was Carnegie Mellon Sandstorm, a 1986 Humvee with the roof chopped off and the seats ripped out. In their place was a half-ton box stuffed with computers. To give Sandstorm an edge, the team collected satellite imagery to figure out the fastest, safest route across the desert. Sandstorm put the hammer down, and you could really see the punch. At that point, the dust was flying, and it was heading to the finish line. But most teams struggled just to get out of the starting From area. Westlake Village in San Diego, ladies and gentlemen, the spirit of Causeray. Out of the gate, Spirit came out, took a left, was looking at the gate ahead to the right and decided that it was too narrow or there was something going on and so it took a U-turn and we didn't make it very far and we had to turn it off at about 20 or 30 feet. Meanwhile, Carnegie Mellon's sandstorm was racing ahead until it hit a series of hairpin turns known as Daggett Ridge. 
and that's where damage from a crash during testing a few weeks earlier came back to haunt them. The sensors misread the road, and the Humvee got stuck. So it just uh, spun and smoked and did that until the race officials killed it. At the end of the first challenge, the dream of self-driving cars still seemed out of reach. When we didn't have a finisher, that was a hard time. The way people look at challenges is if someone finishes, that was a success, and if they don't, it was a failure. I mean, for the scientists among us, that's just another data point, but people want to see somebody get through to the end. <laughs> for better or worse, everybody struggled that first grand challenge. CMU got the furthest. They went, you know, almost eight miles, and um, the rest of the teams did pretty poorly, so, so we were in good company. <laughs> What DARPA had done was create a community of people eager to crack the self-driving car problem. So the agency announced it would give them another shot at the 2005 Grand Challenge. The Grand Challenge was a very unique environment. It was kind of nerdy, kind of geeky, you know, and it was, it was also kind of sports eventsy. As one team that had surfboards on the car because the guy running it was a surfer dude. We were kind of a gimmicky team, sort of by design, you know, having the surfboards and we had some models come out to sort of draw people to, to major events. I'm going to hit the go button! This time, they'd be asked to drive 132 miles in a series of loops around the Nevada desert. The teams had the experience of the first Grand Challenge to build off and a year and a half to get it right. Many of the original players jumped right back in. The announcement was, uh, let's go again, see you in 18 months, and we'll double the money. Well, that's a no-brainer. It became a lot more real. It seemed like something was really on the line for the second one. For the 05 race, Carnegie Mellon would play the odds by running two Humvees, but the competition was stiff. A slew of newcomers dove in, foremost amongst them a German computer scientist named Sebastian Thrun. The time that a robot has to make all the decisions. So I attended the very first Grand Challenge as a spectator, and the best performing vehicle um, did about 7.3 miles before it went up in flames. There were some vehicles that would make it 100 yards and then get completely confused or flip over. And to me, as a roboticist, I felt I could do better than this. His team at Stanford University decided to rely on what was then a relatively new technique called machine learning. Our secret ingredient was AI, it was machine learning. We, we actually trained the robot to do the right thing. We trained it how to vary its speed, where to steer a steering wheel and so on, all these essential things. We believe that the car trained will perform better than the car instructed conventionally. So we went, went out with our car, and trained it to drive on the right road. And that training gave us, the, I think, a, a winning edge. As the 2005 race got underway, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford were neck and neck. Then, halfway through, Carnegie Mellon's Highlander slowed. Just like Sandstorm a year earlier, it had crashed about a week before the race, this time damaging a component that modulated power going to the engine. The CMU team hadn't caught the problem, and once again, their front runner was crippled. My first reaction is, well, that's it. Of course, it's never your last rodeo. You got to get on with things. Team Stanford pulled ahead and crossed the finish line first. 19 months after a disappointing first go round, DARPA finally had a winner. Someone had found two big buckets of ice water and pulled them out of our mic and me. We just felt, oh my God, this is the biggest day of my life. But the defense agency wasn't quite done with self-driving cars. The teams had conquered the desert. Now, the dream of a self-driving car in every garage was getting closer. The only way to really test the technology was to set them loose in a city. The biggest efficiency of the DAPA Grand Challenge was that it was a static race. There were no other cars, no kids running around, no bicycles. It wasn't real traffic. You know, the most disruptive, the most crazy idea would be a whole urban area full of robots running and not crashing into each other. He said, if we could just create that picture somehow and show it to the world, the world would look at this and say, you know, well, I thought it was kind of a stupid idea, but it looks like it, you know, this could be real. I'm impressed with how fast. 
The vehicles were nowhere near safe for public roads, so they settled on an abandoned Air Force base in Victorville, California for the third race, the DARPA Urban Challenge. The teams that braved the races in the desert geared up for a whole new kind of battlefield. Instead of kicking up dirt, they'd be navigating intersections, obeying stop signs, and executing three-point turns. Gone were the Humvees and dune buggies of the desert challenges. In their place came cars that looked almost normal. Toyota Priuses and Ford Escapes, all of them decked out in sensors and stuffed with computers. Machine learning had proven itself in the desert, but to make it work in a city, the cars needed better machine vision. In the first challenge, a Silicon Valley engineer named Dave Hall used cameras to let his robotic Toyota Tundra see its surroundings. As he prepped for the second race, he heard about a different approach called LiDAR, a radar-like device that uses laser beams instead of radio waves to map its surroundings. A lot of it came from talking to the guys at the first race. So one of the conversations I had with Jim McBride at Ford and he said this LiDAR is, is really an unutilized tool. Many of the challenge teams had been using primitive laser sensors that could spot opticals ahead, but with little context and limited resolution. Hall invented his own version of LiDAR that saw in 3D and offered 10 times the detail of the LiDARs that came before it. So if you imagine if you just get 64 laser pointers and stack them up and draw them across, that, those are the beams that I'm scanning across. Whatever those laser beams hit are what I'm measuring. And if the laser beam didn't hit anything, you absolutely knew the road was clear. He made it spin and stuck it on the roof of his car. And he wasn't alone. In the 07 Challenge, nearly every top team used Hall's LiDAR system. The robots now had the vision they needed to see the world clearly, but they still had to figure out how to navigate it. On the day of the DARPA Urban Challenge, the finalists rolled out of the starting gate and into a new world of difficulty. Each had six hours to accomplish three missions, a mix of intersections, tight turns, and even last-minute route changes. And they had to do it without hitting the human-driven Ford Tauruses, the other robots, or breaking the California traffic laws. Carnegie Mellon's vehicle, Boss, push those laws to the limit. It's racing, and you know, Boss had a little reputation for being aggressive, but it had the unimpeachable reputation of being smart and handling everything that had to be handled comfortably. Some teams had more trouble. MIT and Cornell smacked into each other. Other robots locked themselves into a traffic jam. But for the most part, the race itself was as exciting as watching cars drive around a suburb. That is to say, they nailed it. Six teams finished the whole course. So congratulations to Red Whitaker and his team. They've come across the line now. After three challenges, Red Whitaker and Carnegie Mellon finally had come in first. The trophies were nice, but it was about more than prize money. The men and women who'd brought the DARPA challenges to life could now see a more valuable reward, making self-driving cars a reality. DARPA Grand Challenge brought together a community of people. We might on paper be competitors, but we were as eager to share our deepest technological secrets with other teams to help other teams. Members would go from garage to garage and talk to the guys who were running the other vehicles. So there was a tremendous amount of information sharing that took place. That was probably the most important part of the whole challenge. The participants went on to form the backbone of the self-driving car industry. When Sebastian Thrun started Google's self-driving car project in 2009, he knew exactly where to look for help. I hired um, the best people I could find. And guess whom I hired? I hired the technological heads of our competing teams from Dublin Challenge. Dave Hall turned his company, Velodyne, into a leader in the now booming LiDAR industry. And Red Whitaker continued his work at Carnegie Mellon, building robots and training the next generation of engineers. The future is in very good hands. That potential that I think everybody sees today in 2017 is goes all back to the DARPA Urban Challenge. Had the DARPA Urban Challenge not occurred and the DARPA Urban Challenge, none of this would have happened right now. 
But the industry has at least one grand challenge left, convincing the public that it's time to let the robots take the wheel.